finally possibly the strongest Android phone and definitely the strongest one from the Samsung lineup has arrived for review in the Bench House studio. We would like to present Samsung's newest flagship, the Samsung S20 Ultra. The motto of this phone seems to be everything to the max, as if Samsung wanted to say, do you want the fastest and strongest hardware? Alright, you want the best screen? Here you go. Huge battery? You've got it. The best processor? Yes, but only for USA, the rest of you get the next best thing. As much RAM as you want so everything can be buttery smooth. Oh wait, we also have memory modules, you have that on the max. Wait, let's make it ultra. Did we forget anything? Nope. Well, it's all going to cost you. When all of this is combined into an actual phone and you take the cost of all the components inside the device, add the marketing campaigns, sales revenue, importers, local taxes, and wham, you get a price of 1400 euros or roughly 1540 US dollars. We did ask for best of the best. Now if you want to stick to the prices we were used to seeing on until now, you should stick to the regular S20 model. On the other hand, if you want the Ultra model, then you will have to pay the Ultra price tag. Let's be clear, the price tag is extremely high, we wish it wasn't, but this is what Samsung has decided this kind of phone should cost. The S20 Plus is a model that we will compare with other phones by specs, but the S20 Ultra is a phone that is definitely made for those who want to pay the extra to have the best of the best. The Galaxy S20 Ultra comes with an impressive 6.9 inch screen. Some will be fascinated by the size while the other will turn to say that they would never have a such a huge device. Whether it's watching movies, playing games or just browsing through menus, simply Infinity-O Dynamic AMOLED 2X screen with its Quad HD Plus resolution, HDR10 certificate and a pixel density of 511 is the best thing in the smartphone world that your eyes can experience. Samsung is promoting it on its website as no movie tickets needed. And though that may be a bit of preposterous advertising, if you compare it to the screen of any other mobile phone, it really is justified. I don't think I've ever seen a brighter screen and the display quality is definitely far ahead from other competitors. Samsung is also the first manufacturer to bring 120Hz refresh display to the mainstream non-gaming phones. Last year they gave their 90Hz displays to OnePlus for OnePlus 7 Pro phone just to see how the market will take it. And when the users praised the fluidity the high refresh rate offers, it made sense to apply the recipe to its next flagship series, but also make it even better. We should mention that the 120Hz refresh rate is only active in Full HD Plus resolution of 2400 x 1080 pixels. If you want to use the full resolution of the display, you can select 3200 x 1440 pixels, but then you will then use the standard refresh rate of 60Hz. I would definitely choose the first option without a doubt, even if it does cost me an extra percent of battery. Of course, the Infinity O screen also means a punch hole camera at the top, which is centrally aligned. I do think this is far better solution than any notch or last year's dual selfie camera on the right side of the screen. Samsung is a company that first started using edge screens and since then they have been reducing the curved edges with every subsequent model, while other manufacturers are still trying to implement edge displays. Samsung seems to have found the right amount of curve in the S20 series and its smallest so far. After a week of constant use of the S20 Ultra, the screen of the phone I normally use that I had no complaints about before suddenly looked like I switched from a flagship to a much cheaper phone. Samsung shows true dominance in this aspect and combined with speedy hardware, everything works incredibly smooth. And when it comes to speed, we're back to Exynos again, this year the 990 series. Of course we haven't had the chance to test any phone with the Snapdragon 865 chipset that Samsung users in Europe have been wishing for years, but combined with the staggering, some will say overkill, 12GB of ultra-fast LPDDR5 memory and the aforementioned amazing screen display, this phone really can handle any task you can think of. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of mobile benchmark results. Whether it gets a couple of points more or less, it doesn't matter as much as I mostly trust my own feeling, which, in the case of S20 Ultra Phone, is by far the best. It's like the phone is telling me, hey, give me another task, all of this was very easy. So, while on previous generations Snapdragon was much better and left the user outside of USA wishing for it, I don't think there's much need for it this time around. 
As for the storage, since on S20 Ultra you can use memory cards, unlike many other flagship models, they don't have this option anymore. You don't really need anything more than 128 gigabytes, and this is exactly the amount of storage that this model on our test comes with. There are more expensive versions with bigger built-in storage, but memory cards are a cheaper option. The only dilemma remains consumption, but we do not know that since we only got one version of the device on the test. Battery has a whooping 5000 mAh battery and we've got to say that it is a really huge one. Fast charging with 45 watts is supported, but a huge complaint to the manufacturer is that a 45 watt charger is not part of the package on this phone and instead you do get a 25 watt one. It is really not pleasing to give 1400 euros for a phone and not get the fastest charger that you need to buy separately. For those who love wireless phone charging, we will point out that this time 15 watt wireless charging is enabled and if you want to share some of your phone energy with your friend's empty battery, there is a 9 watt reversible charge. The only dilemma about Exynos 990 is the battery life, but we don't have a Snapdragon version as well to make a comparison. We ran our standard 10 hour YouTube video test on a freshly activated phone with brightness slider set to 50%. Though we should mention that even at half brightness, it is still brighter than some phones on their maximum. After 10 hours of video, an excellent 43% of the battery remained. So how does it do when it's loaded with apps? I installed about 70% of applications I normally use, two email accounts and two different mail applications, standard Facebook, Instagram, messaging services such as Viber and WhatsApp, and with all apps doing their normal background activities run the test again. This time around, only 22% of the battery remained. So 20% difference without touching the phone during this time. This is the experience we previously had with the S10 Plus phone with some services running very actively in the background and draining the battery faster. Realistically, the S20 Ultra manages to pull off a whole day even with heavy use, but it is not that carefree experience where at the end of the day you have a decent amount of battery left. As for the design, we do have some mixed feelings. The front of the phone looks phenomenal, but the back design has received an even harsher criticism from the audience than we expected. After the infamous iPhone cameras, the S20 series received the epitome of Samsung's kitchen stovetop. Of course, I'm talking about the huge camera system that everyone thinks it's a bit oversized. Personally, I wish the phone back was a little more exclusive looking. It is as if the company design team has fallen into some creative crisis and has been going on for two years straight. Without some details like an inscription or anything else that will break the monotony of the back, Samsung phones have simply become boring. For example, OnePlus and Motorola with their Zoom have shown that it can be done way better. In any case, as a potential owner of the S20 Ultra phone, absolutely the first thing I would do is get a good phone cover, both to protect it and improve the overall look. When it comes to the overall feel in your hand, the S20 Ultra is a huge and heavy phone. For someone who is not used to it, it is probably unacceptably big. If you ever owned Note 1, this should feel right at home. The device has a great weight balance and that is something that Samsung probably does best. Also, the whole phone is covered with glass, Corning Gorilla Glass 6 no less, as Ultra gets all the best bits of hardware. On the right side of the phone, there are power and volume buttons, well made of course, with no flimsy stuff on the phone like this. On the upper side, there is a SIM drawer, but like with all other S20 phones, Ultra also supports eSIM. In addition to the microphone hole on the bottom, there is also the main speaker, while the other one is on the other side, as well as the USB 3.2 Type-C port. This time around there is nothing on the left side and lucky for most users, no more Bixby button. If there are any Bixby fans out there, I haven't met one personally, you can invoke it by long pressing the power button. The fingerprint reader is of course below the screen and I have to admit that I was expecting a bit more noticeable and tangible improvement over the S10. It didn't happen, at least in my own personal impression. The stereo speakers are loud but I would not say too impressive in terms of sound quality. Far better than average, but I've heard better. Admittedly, HTC hasn't really dropped a phone in a long time, but that is still something they are remembered for. And of course, as expected, you won't find the 3.5mm headphone jack this time around. Connectivity options are all still there, plus the 5G. Since 5G infrastructure is still not widespread, we have yet to see how it will perform on this phone. And now, let's get to the cameras. The choice of sensor Samsung has decided to put in its best phone caught us off guard. When Samsung reveals its strongest model, you were expecting nothing but the best. In this case, this means a 108 megapixel main camera, 48 megapixel zoom camera, 
12 megapixel ultra wide camera and 0.3 megapixel TOF camera. The 108 megapixel main camera features an upgraded version of the Samsung ISOCELL Bright HMX quad buyer sensor called the HM1. You may remember that we've already seen the HMX on Xiaomi Mi Note 10 phones that we've tested back in November last year. Since it uses pixel binning technology, HM1 merges 9 pixels into one, producing 12 megapixel photos, hence Samsung calling it Nona Cell. Nona is 9 in Latin. Of course, this means that you will lose a certain amount of details compared to one-to-one -to -one photography, but you will get better light performance, less noise and better dynamic range, especially in challenging light conditions. The physical characteristics of the main sensor are 26mm focal length, 79 degrees viewing angle, aperture of f1.8, optical stabilization and phase autofocus. Technically, the main camera is also wide angle lens since anything between 35 and 24mm is considered wide angle and below 24mm is ultra wide. We're not quite sure if the zoom camera or the primary camera are the main stars of this phone, but judging by the space zoom 100 times sign, we would say it's the latter. It is so-called periscope camera, something we've already seen on the Huawei P30 Pro series, which achieves the 4 times optical zoom by physically moving the prism in front of the sensor at the 90 degree angle to the phone. In short, nothing new, not even with the zoom or the telephoto lens. And before you start wondering why the sign states that it has a 10 times optical zoom, it is actually 4 times optical zoom that Samsung calls looseless hybrid optic zoom, which means that up to 10 times magnification. You shouldn't notice any loss in quality typically caused by a digital zoom. The zoom sensor is also a 48 megapixel quad buyer with focal length of up to 103 millimeters with a 24 degree viewing angle. It is f3.5 which is quite decent for this type of lens and uses face detection, autofocus and optical stabilization which is important for getting quality photos that are not blurry. The lens that doesn't have the pixel merging technology is a 12 megapixel one, 13mm f2.2 ultra wide, the only one with super steady video capabilities. And here we come to the biggest disappointment when it comes to Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra. For a 1400 euro phone called the Ultra, we do expect everything to be, as the name says, Ultra. And to be honest, it is not. If the 35 times cheaper Xiaomi Mi Note 10 could have autofocus on its ultra wide lens, why doesn't the best Samsung one have it? From our experience, we do think that autofocus is very important, even in ultra wide angle lenses, because it gives additional flexibility and usability to this camera, which can be used in many more situations and with much more re better results. The fourth camera is time of flight, not for shooting, but for measuring the depth of the object within frame and generally for better bokeh effect when taking portraits. When it comes to the quality of the main sensor images, they are really good, although perhaps not quite as spectacular as we hoped for. When you have a 108 megapixel sensor with an aperture of f1.8, it is really hard to ruin an image quality, even if you try to. When there is enough light, even the 8 megapixel sensors take good photos and the 108 megapixel sensor shows their full potential. Thanks to the pixel binning, the dynamic range is fantastic, the details are abundant, noise practically non-existent and the colors look almost identical to what your eyes are seeing. Selecting full 108 megapixels gives you much more detail, at a slight cost to dynamics and color rendering. Although we constantly recommend lower resolution shooting, this time around we get the impression that the resolution you choose depends on the scene and what you want to achieve. If you're looking for a lot of details in your shots, especially in subjects and objects that are not far or in the shade and the sun doesn't directly hit your lens, feel free to use the 108 megapixel. The processing power is certainly there to make the most out of it. In low light conditions, at least on paper, the main sensor of the S20 Ultra should impress and Samsung didn't disappoint there a bit. The noise in the photos is minimal, there is plenty of detail with realistic color rendering. The dynamic range is kept at very high level and in case there really is low light, there is a softer night mode that is surprisingly usable, especially in the darkest parts of the image. The only downside to the night mode is that it really takes quite long to shoot, around 8 to 9 seconds, which means your hand needs to be steady if you want quality images. Samsung Space Zoom won't really allow you to take photos of the moon and stars, as the phone has a 4x optical zoom, while everything more than that is digital zoom. Images at maximum hardware magnification of 4x are great, crisp, detail with true colors and wide dynamic range.
Compared to the Huawei P30 Pro, which has a larger zoom five times compared to the four times this one has, the images produced by S20 Ultra are better in every aspect. There is more detail, the image is significantly sharper, the colors are more realistic, as in the dynamic range, especially in the darker parts of the image. With the advertised 100 times space zoom, as expected, anything more than 10 times magnification is very questionable usability. Outside of the optical zoom range, the images become blurry, grainy, just as you would expect from a digital zoom. The only advantages of using digital zoom might be that it allows you to get what you want right away with no additional editing. In any case, 100 times space zoom is definitely a marketing gimmick. And even if they put 1000 times magnification, the results will still be the same. At least with this sensor. In low light conditions and maximum optical zoom, the images are very good in terms of color, dynamics and details. All thanks to the nature of this sensor, which was made for these kind of situations. The ultra wide lens, the one we've complained about for the lack of autofocus, gives very decent photos. The dynamic range is at the high level, the colors are slightly saturated but there is a trace of noise and some of the details are lost in the dark parts of the frame. Lens correction is on high level and there is also a software option to deal with additional distortion. Of course, our points of reference were the best wide angle lenses we've encountered to date, the ones of the Note 10 Plus and the Mate 30 Pro. Good thing about this lens is that the 13mm focal length allows viewing angle of wide 123 degrees like on the Note 10 Plus and the S10 Plus. By comparison, the P30 Pro allows for 107 degrees, the Mate 30 Pro has 120 degrees, while the Mi Note 10 has 117 degrees. Night photos reflect daytime performance. Images are good, but due to obvious limitations, not like the ones on the main sensor. The colors are still very decent and the sharpness and level of detail are unexpectedly high, which was a pleasant surprise to us. The selfie camera is one of the biggest enhancements to the S20 Ultra. This is the third quad buyer sensor on this phone with a resolution of 40 megapixel and a decent wide angle up to 79 degrees and a focal length of 26 millimeters, as with the primary sensor. The aperture of f2.2 promises plenty of light and there is also phase detection autofocus which further enhances the usability of the camera. The pictures are really high quality, sharp, with good dynamics and most importantly with accurate color rendering, especially the skin tone. We are talking about 10 megapixel images, whilst choosing full sensor resolution gives you more detail, especially when you have plenty of light at your disposal. PDAF lets you play with focus and there is a live focus mode in which the software isolates the subject from the background and does the job at a very high level. When it comes to video recording, Samsung has done a great job with the S20 Ultra. All four cameras can shoot 4K at 30 frames per second and the primary sensor has both 4K at 60 frames per second and 8K at 24 frames per second capabilities. It is also interesting that the video stabilization on the main camera is possible in all modes. As far as the 8K footage is concerned, we do not have an 8K TV at our disposal at the moment in order to see its full capabilities, but judging from what we can see on the 4K monitor, 8K footage offers a truly impressive level of detail. The main sensor's 4K shots are at the level we're used to from their best phones. The powerful HM1 sensor provides true color rendering, excellent dynamic range and a wealth of details. In 30 frames per second, the video has bitrate of about 38 megabytes per second and about 70 megabytes per second in 60 frames per second. With higher FPS, we noticed a strong post-processing and slight more aggressive sharpening algorithms. Other parameters are at the same level as 30 frames per second. When zooming in on an object from a 4K video, the camera transitions to a telephoto sensor, which is visible for a moment, as it is slightly shifts in quality due to a difference between the sensors, but is far better than one on the P30 Pro, and was uncomfortably noticeable. Stabilization does its job phenomenally, and the level of detail and sharpness are great even when you activate a slight digital zoom. If you zoom in too much, there will be a very steep decline in quality, definitely. What we definitely liked was the very steady focus for this type of lens. The difference between 30 and 60 FPS in 4K shots is most noticeable in sharpness. The colors are slightly flushed out compared to the main sensor and the frame has a wide dynamic range beautifully capturing the lightest and darkest elements. The ultra wide lens has a super steady video option which is limited to 1080p. These shots are good, we have been unable to see a significant difference compared to the normal stabilization in 4K. The shots are good for a fixed focus camera, detailed enough and with the right colors and dynamics, very usable for shooting when you need extra frame width. 
It is similar when light conditions are not so favorable for making good shots. The S20 Ultra copes well with noise, managing to retain details on all three sensors. Even when other phones struggle to keep their focus, the huge sensors and large aperture allow for S20 Ultra to display fairly true colors in addition to plenty of details. Of course, the worst results are with the ultra-wide angle sensor, but this is expected given the nature and specifications of the sensor. While this may sound bad, please keep in mind that these shots are still compared to the best cameras in the world, and most users would not even notice most of the flaws we did mention. Also, let's not forget about the single take recording option that I talked about in our initial introduction of the S20 series. This is a great option for anyone who is not camera savvy, or simply likes to capture the moment without thinking about it. The single take option allows you to move while you shot, just pressing the capture key and the phone takes photos and videos during the next 7 to 8 seconds, in several different ways like ultra wide, regular photos, with or without the bokeh effect, black and white and so on. The result that you get are dozens of pictures and videos that you can choose from and keep what you like best. Some manufacturers have had something like this before, but I personally like Samsung take on this feature. You will notice that we have compared the camera a lot to the P30 Pro. It was for a simple reason to see what kind of progress the phone industry made over the course of one year. Sure, since P30 Pro was released, several even better cameras appeared on phones, but we were much more interested to see how much technology has advanced in the past year. Quite nice, and we have to say that the S20 Ultra cameras were very satisfying to use. But let's not crown the king just yet, we should wait for a couple of other phones that will be released this year to see which one will sit on the throne. Couple words about the software. The device comes with Android 10 and One UI 2 interface. This UI really shows a distinctive visual identity that Samsung has been creating for years that cannot be compared to anyone else in the Android world. The only honorable mention would be HTC while they were still in the Android market race. What is also noticeable is cooperation with Microsoft, since the S20 Ultra comes with a whole bundle of Microsoft applications, including Office Suite, LinkedIn, OneDrive and especially Outlook as the default mail client. There are no recognizable Samsung mail apps on this phone either. In case that you're not a fan of the setup, you can always download other email apps on the Play Store. And of course, the Samsung DeX option is to bring the desktop of your mobile phone to the big screen and use it as your computer. You used to need a special interface and Samsung dock, but now it's enough to connect via USB cable. An excellent option for those who do not want to bring a laptop with them and have something to connect and do some work when needed. These are just some of the things that small manufacturers don't have. It's the extra quality that big brands have built for years, even if they do seem invisible at first. And so we come to a conclusion of our review of the S20 Ultra. There is nothing more to add, a great phone, definitely best phone in the Android world, with beefed up specs to back it all up. The whole S20 series, even though we may not like the design of the back of the phone, made a far better impression than the S10 a year ago. Perhaps because we expected that the Galaxy S series 10th anniversary would be special, and in fact, it just wasn't. If you are willing to spend 1540 US dollars and want the best possible Android phone on the market, then this is a phone for you. The Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra is designed to meet the needs of the most demanding users. It dominates in every technical aspect over any other phone and is intended for those who always want more or better. I can't say that the Ultra will be the best selling of all the S20 series phones, but I personally think that it will actually. Thank you once again for watching the Bench House review of the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and comment below and also subscribe for more reviews that are on their way. Once again, my name is Marco and please stay tuned for more reviews to come. I'll see you next time.